Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Molly. I see some recognizable faces, and some faces I don't recognize. But well, welcome to the Rockland Public Library, and thank you for taking the time to come out and support us in this particular program that we are doing. So, just a couple of things. If you need to use the restroom, the key is right at the circulation desk, and the restroom is right between the elevator door. Okay, and I hope you enjoy the evening, and all of you should have a program. I'm giving one out to everybody, okay? And now I would like Paul Engel to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Hello. Um, as Lily said, my name is Paul, and I'm the, the director of the Brockton Public Library. And I think the, the, the best thing that I get to do in my job, uh, day in, day out, is to uh, kick off events like these. Uh, it's, it's truly a pleasure to, uh, to be the director of this library. On behalf of the library trustees, the board of trustees, on behalf of the staff of the library, and on behalf of the library foundation, I want to welcome you to the Brockton Public Library, to your public library. Tonight, I hope you really enjoy this, this series. Uh, so far, we've had great conversations afterwards. And um, without further ado, I'll kick it off to Jonathan Stroud. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hi, my name is Jonathan Stroud, and it's my honor to talk about the American Dialogue Series. It is a project that was conceived, developed, and organized by Melissa Vega, the, the library's literacy and ESL coordinator. First, I would like to thank our library director, Paul Engel, for seeing how important this topic is and seeing the need to make our library the best community center around. Under the banner of the Brockton Public Library and funded by the Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation, we've just started this project series. In this series, we'll challenge the notion that older immigrant experiences should be separated from newer immigrant experiences. So the American Dialogue series is made up of five different parts. So first, there are lectures. Second, there are forums. Third, there are interviews, training, workshops, and interviews of immigrants, past and present. Fourth, we'll create a new segment in our adult services department upstairs that will record interviews that will be placed on digital files. And then finally, each year, we will publish some of the interviews in anthologies. So this series is both important and unique. The reason why it is important is because part of its existence is owed to immigration being a hot button issue in our local and national news. This project is unique because the, project, because the purpose of this project is to bring two mighty immigrant experiences and conversation and history together. Since they've been separated so far in this immigrational debate, these two things that we're going to be talking about is the Ellis Island European American immigrant groups with the newer African, Asian, Latin American, and Caribbean Im immigrant groups. The thing is, nobody is trying to bring these different groups together except the American Immigration Dialogue Series. So I want to thank you for coming out tonight and supporting us, and we hope that you continue to come. Thank you. And now I would like Phyllis, Alice, to come up and introduce our guest speaker. Pleasure. Good evening. My name is Phyllis Ellis. I am the president of the Brockton Area Branch in ACP. It is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening Dr. Barbara Lewis. There are many adjectives I could use to describe this wonderful woman. Brilliant, gifted, created, creative, intelligent, just to name a few. Dr. Lewis is a professional scholar of history, theater, literature, and social sciences. She earned her doctorate in theater at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She has taught at City College, Lehman, and New York University. This evening, Dr. Lewis will be leading a discussion and presenting a PowerPoint on the American Dream price tag, the Royals, Massachusetts' first immigrant dynasty. 
It is part of the American Immigration Dialogue series being presented by the Brockton Public Library under the title, We Are All Americans Now. Dr. Lewis is a perfect person to lead this discussion and to do this presentation. She is a historian and has the driven passion for the advancement of freedom. You can tell this by some of her publications in American Circus, The Lynch Victim as Clown, or From Pale to Parlor, Hidden It Out of the Park. Her current position as director of the William Monroe Trotter Institute for the study of black culture at UMass Boston enables her to do all these things she is so passionate about. The William Monroe Trotter Institute for the study of black culture was founded at UMass in Boston in 1984. It was founded to address the needs and concerns of the black community and communities of color in Boston and Massachusetts through research technical assistance, and public service. You see, Dr. Lewis is especially interested in a larger recognition of the political import of the theater, which brings people together into dialogue and discovery of a truth beyond the strictly personal. It is a dialogue that brings us this, to this evening's presentation. The American Dream, the price tag, the Royals, Massachusetts' first immigrant dynasty, it piqued my interest, and I'm sure it would pique yours. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the fabulous, the talented, the prestigious, and the beautiful Dr. Barbara Lewis. <laughs> I'm actually um, motivated now to talk um, a little bit about what draws me to history, um, and that is that um, I didn't study it in high school. I went to high school outside of Montreal, and I studied European history. Um, and so coming back to this, is it, is it coming through? OK. <laughs> a little bit closer, OK. Um, so I, I came back to the States after high school and I was, I wanted to know more about uh, this country that I had left. Um, one of the reasons why I w was sent to high school in Montreal was because of segregation. Um, my mother uh, felt that segregation was not the proper environment uh, for me to learn in. And so um, she was a teacher. Uh, she was not a wealthy teacher, but she saved her money and she researched and found a school in a town in Quebec called Granby. Um, you know something about Granby? Are you serious? That's amazing. Okay. The address was 232 Main Street. Pardon? Boivet. Boivet? Okay. Um, and uh, so I, I was there. I mean, I enjoyed being there. It was a wonderful experience. I appreciated it. But it also made me very hungry to know more about the history of this country. And it's fascinating to me very often when I'm introduced, I'm introduced as a historian. I am not a historian. I'm a literate. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I love it. I love being described that way uh, because it, it says that you know I've done some homework so I appreciate that but actually my um, my drive my academic drive is actually more connected to the word and connected to literature which I also love um, so I wanted to, to share that and I also wanted to make <clears throat> a bow to uh, the range of immigration histories in in our country we have such a wealth of them. Um, I'm thinking particularly of something that I've learned since I've come to Massachusetts, and that is the individuality and the very special character. All of us have special characters. But there's a, a particular uh, history that um, I'm very drawn to and fond of, and that's the Cape Verdean history of immigration. 
uh, the Cape Verdean community came here, was brought here in the 19th century, although they were um, folks prior to that time, uh, but they were brought here to work in the whaling industries and in the cranberry bogs of uh, Cape Cod. Um, what fascinates me, though, is their ingenuity, and that is that when the whaling industry started to wane, um, Moby Dick and all, um, they took those whaling boats and they converted them. They converted them into packet ships and they created their own, let's put it in quotes, Ellis Island or New Bedford. Uh, and they were in control of the ships and the passage going back and forth from Cape Cod, uh, from Massachusetts to um, the various islands of um, Cape Verde. Um, so they, um, they have a twin immigration history, but also an individual and separate immigration history. And there's so many different immigration stories. When we rely on the Ellis Island story, which also in and of itself is wonderful, um, it doesn't give us the full dimension of how different communities came here, came here, let me be a little poetic, I hope, through their own speed and on their own wheels. Uh, so I just wanted to um, give that um, as, a, as a bow to um, the various immigration stories that we have in this country, and there's so many different ones. Um, there's, of course, the, the, I can't name them all. Uh, I'm gonna just permit me one little digression. I've had a couple already. But that digression has to do with, at one point, I did teach at the University of Kentucky, which is in the middle of the country, in the Midwest, and I believe it, I know it was Ohio that we flew into, and you know how they have these buses where you go from when you land and then they take you wherever you're gonna go next. Everybody on that bus was speaking German. I was like, am I still in the United States? And it was, but because the, the immigration into that part of the country was so heavily German and it, it held on. This was in 2000, I think it was 2002, 2003 or something. So it was, it was in this century, but their roots were still so strong that German was all around me. Um, and I mean, you, you know, this is, a, this is a country of many languages, many cultures, um, and many, many different stories. So I will turn around and look at the PowerPoint and start talking to you about <laughs> the PowerPoint that um, I've prepared for today, which uh, goes back to, um, it actually goes back to the 1600s, um, and it moves from the 1600s into the 1700s, 1800s. Um, I'm trying to think if we hit the 1900s. We might not, but we certainly get back to this century. Okay, so, um, the, um, the family in question are the royals. They didn't start out as the royals. Um, the first one to come over here was William Ryle, um, but he was terribly, terribly ambitious, as so many immigrant folks are. Um, the, the, the story is that the, the ones who tend to emigrate are the ones who have the ambition, the industry, and the drive. So he certainly had all of those. Um, and to express, at least this is my interpretation, to express that drive, he took the name Ryle that didn't have an O and he added an O and made it royal. So, um, can you flip? Okay, I start here with the daughters. These are uh, the daughters, not of William Ryle or William Royal, but the daughters of Isaac Royal Jr. Isaac Royal Jr. was the grandson of William Ryle, who was the first one to come in 1629. Um, I chose this because for me it expresses aristocracy. Um, the, the young girls are dressed in, um, I'm going to assume it's satin. I'm not absolutely sure, but it, they're beautiful dresses. Um, and some of the emblems that are around them are emblems of traditional painting, um, the aristocracy in English um, history. Um, they are both, um, they both get married. Um, they marry well, they marry into wealth. The um, tradition among the um, immigrant 
class of that echelon tended to be that they conserved uh, the money and added to it. Um, sometimes that meant they didn't marry for love, but for property. But that was the way it was. Um, and um, these um, young girls uh, grow up. Uh, one of them actually dies a bit early um, after childbirth. But one of them escapes with her father in 1773 when uh, the American Revolution is threatening. Um, next one. I wanted to start uh, in the beginning. <clears throat> and um, I saw wealth as being planted and then growing and ensuring the future. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read some of what I wrote. In the beginning, there were seeds. And the beginning was in the 1600s, when coming to America was a lottery, a chance to scramble up the ranks from commoner to gentry. Few went farther than William Ryle, a poor, ambitious young man born in England who left the home he had known and came ashore in Salem in 1629. One of the things I learned from doing this research was that Salem and Boston, and Salem and also Boston were major ports of arrival in the early uh, 17th century. Up until that point, I had thought it was Boston. But Salem figures in this story very much as well. Uh, so when uh, William Ryle landed, he had no family of note and few connections. What he had was youth and determination, the strength of his body. He also came as a contract worker, so he had a job. And his job was to cut down the trees. Um, at the time, um, the, the, it was largely forest. And to clear and create settlements, the forest had to be cut down. And so that was his initial job. Um, he was very different, though, in terms of his ambition. Um, his ambition allowed him to climb higher than some other folks were able to do. He seeded a dynasty um, which yielded Mary and Elizabeth Royal. Here I was connecting the um, painting that we had seen previously, which was done by John Singleton Copley. Um, and Copley is the artist after whom uh, Copley Square is named, and also the Copley Library in uh, Boston. Industriousness, I wanted to show a bit of the hard work that it, that it took to create the, the beginning of this country, to clear the, to clear the trees and create um, the fields uh, and to harvest what was grown on the fields. Um, one of the things I have to say that I particularly like the guy off in the right with the jug. <laughs> um, he decided to take a, a bit of a rest from, from his um, hard work. Um, but I also note, or at least I believe, that uh, the men were not the only ones working. There were also women working. The, the labor at that time was shared. Um, but there was so much labor to do, and maybe I'm uh, soft peddling things a little bit, there was so much pe uh, work to do that um, it was realized that all the work could not be completed by the folks who had come over on ships like the Arabella. They needed other workers. And so those workers, um, the first of those workers were actually Native Americans. Um, we have the first war against the Native Americans in I believe it starts in 1636, 1637. Um, and um, the captives of those wars are enslaved. Yep, next one. Um, I'm going back here to William Royal, uh, or William Ryle, and um, the cost, the cost that, the severing self from yesterday. In the case of the individuals and the communities who were put to work without their consent, absolutely they were severed from yesterday, but they did not sever themselves from yesterday. The ones who did sever themselves from yesterday intentionally uh, were the immigrants, the, mostly from England, uh, but certainly not exclusively from England. Um, 
There were um, immigrants who came uh, of their own volition, also from um, the Netherlands. Uh, the Dutch uh, preceded the English um, here in um, the New World, and there were a lot of skirmishes and fights and battles between them. Um, I talk here about the axes that were in hand, and the axes were the ones that chopped down the trees, chopped down the past. Um, when the immigrants, the European immigrants came, they came for the purpose of, at least the express purpose of um, pursuing their religion. Um, but that was not an option that was accorded to the people who were here. They did not have the option of pursuing their religion. They were instead perceived as devils, as um, heathens. And um, that was to a great extent um, the incentive for war against them in the 1630s. Um, I'm going back a little bit to Salem, uh, which um, we have known about uh, in history relative to the witch, um, the witch trials the, of, of later in the century. Um, I was fascinated to learn about more about Salem and all the people who arrived and um, how in the stores when they came, the goods that were in the stores were identical. Um, they would have 50 hats or you know, uh, 200 pairs of shoes and there was very, very little differentiation. What I got from that was that there was a mold. There was a mold in which, into which the majority uh, placed themselves. And to distinguish for yourself from that mold took a lot of energy, a lot of thought, a lot of effort. Um, let's go to the next one. This is an image, a facsimile of the house or the home that um, William Ryle would have first um, created for himself. Uh, it's based on the homes that were already here that were created by the Native Americans. Um, there was not a lot of money um, to create mansions or um, larger homes. So in the beginning, there was a, a sense of similarity between the lives of the natives and the lives of the immigrant community that moved in. Next. Um, so I talk about this here. At first, William Ryle had no money for luxuries. His starter home was basic, a wigwam, which offered minor basic protection against cold and rain. Even in the 1600s, and I'm trying to be relevant to now, even in the 1600s, getting a decent place to live was no small task. But he knew he had to pull himself up from the bottom, and um, he was a convert to the gospel of hard work. But also, when you work hard, that's sometimes not enough. You have to find ways to distinguish yourself, how to get away from the pack, how to pull away from the crowd. Um, and his focus on land was one way that he did that. Um, here I'm talking about um, kind of the similarity of life uh, that existed in places like, like Salem. Um, and you see that they were able, this is probably an image from the, from the 19th century and certainly not from the 17th century. But through all of that industry, um, working together, there was this ability to build up um, a civilization, to build up um, architectural wonders, to create roads, and to demonstrate a, a civilization that was definitely on the move. 
this image comes again from Salem, and it's an image of life after, so after hours, life after the hard day of work. Um, they're mostly men in here, and um, they like to relax and enjoy commonality with one another over a beer, uh, over a drink. Um, it's also um, a way for me to talk about uh, Phoebe Green, who was um, the woman that William Ryle decided to marry and with whom he created a family. Um, her stepfather had owned, also owned a tavern, so it's likely that they met uh, in that way, but they had similar ideas and similar dreams. They did not want the life of, um, the crowded life. They wanted to move away, and so they did move away, um, and they moved um, farther up, farther north into um, uh, Massachusetts. Next one. Uh, they moved up to, um, eventually they settled in Maine, but they, they move um, farther and farther north. Um, and when they get to Maine, um, so he goes to Maine um, and on the coast of, he settles on the coast of Maine. He has about 200 acres uh, on the coast of Maine. Um, but um, shortly thereafter, the Abenaki, which is a, um, a Native American tribe in Maine, um, is unhappy about losing some of its land. And so there is a war um, between the uh, settlers in Maine and the Abenaki. This is an image of pursuit. Um, one of the first examples or genres of American literature is the, uh, the captivity tale. Um, sometimes the captives would be uh, transported from um, what's, let's call it civilization in quotes, um, to where the natives were living, and they would live among the natives um, and learn their ways, sometimes even learn their languages. And a few of them were so enamored of the native life that they did not want to leave. That was not true of all of them, um, certainly not. Um, and some of those who were uh, released wrote captivity tales about that experience. Um, and those were some of the earliest forms of American literature. Yes. Um, this is probably a, a, a rather controversial part of um, the, the talk. And that has to do with uh, Thanksgiving, which we have just um, celebrated. Um, so each side in the war for land and dominance committed atrocities. That is war's nature. And some of the immigrants who were captured and held by the natives wrote about their experiences. Mary Rowlandson wrote a 1682 captivity tale, an early best bestseller. Native children were Christianized and taught to know the Bible. John Eliot, for whom Eliot Square is named, and that's in Dorchester, uh, earned fame across Boston and New England for his conversion dominance work among the natives, translating a Bible into the Massachusetts tongue. Before Phyllis Wheatley published her poems, and they often re reference the Bible, another child female slave in the Commonwealth wrote a ballad about a 1746 native raid against Deerfield. Lucy Terry, unlike Wheatley, lived a very long life. Um, Terry, who was purchased by and married a she was originally purchased uh, by a white owner, but um, later, uh, when she was older, she was also purchased by a free African-American named Prince, um, who, and she became his wife. Um, she was a very courageous, um, intelligent, industrious woman who never stopped fighting for her rights and those of her family. Before the trustees of Williams College, uh, this would be in the 1700s, she argued for the right of her son, Festus, to be admitted as a student. Although she was quite eloquent about it, her petition was denied. 
She also went to, uh, she also argued and won against the unlawful taking of her property in Vermont. The family had moved to Vermont after uh, being in Massachusetts. Um, and um, here I'm quickly comparing um, her, the, the span of her life with the span of the life of Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley, who um, was, um, who has been called the um, poet laureate of the American Revolution, was also um, sold, in, uh, she was sold as a slave in Boston. Um, but she found very early that she had literary skill um, and uh, the family that purchased her uh, in essence became her sponsors, her patrons, and they supported her um, acquisition of knowledge um, and um, supported her publishing her poems. So she was able to publish her poems very early um, in the 1700s and she goes, 1770s, she goes to England where her volume um, is published in London. Um, and uh, unfortunately though, her life is very short. Um, during the American Revolution, there was a serious impact on the economy, it fell. Um, and the family that had owned her, the Wheatleys, also passed. Um, and she had few supporters. Um, so she died in 1784 of uh, poverty um, and um, destitution um, in Boston. She was, I believe, around 31 years old at that time. Um, Lucy Terry, though, uh, or Lucy Terry Prince, um, lived to be in her 80s or 90s, and she was vigorous and hale up until the end, riding um, horseback even um, in her uh, elder years. Um, so they're, they're very different stories, um, but one of the fascinating things about having uh, two stories to tell is that one story doesn't become emblematic of the whole. Next. Um, here I wanted to talk about um, the, the, the royals after they um, leave Maine, after they are pushed out of Maine. Um, they come back to, um, to the Boston area, to Charlestown and to Dorchester, and they also, one of them um, marries into the Elliott family, uh, marries a daughter of John Elliott. Um, and, uh, but um, that, his, his first marriage, so his first uh, wife and child, um, they, uh, they die, and that is of course devastating to him. Um, and he makes a decision that he wants to go elsewhere and become, so his father was an immigrant into um, the New England and um, Isaac, uh, the grandson of William Ryle, decides that he will go to the Caribbean, uh, to Antigua, um, where he will reestablish himself. Um, and um, when he gets to, next one. Okay, well this is, um, when he gets to Antigua, he invests in uh, sugar and in slaves. Um, he um, buys a plantation, um, he again, he marries well, again, um, he marries a woman who already has um, land and slaves, um, and they live extremely well uh, for a while until the 1730s. Um, the slave population in Antigua is um, very large, um, the, and it has to do with the demands of growing sugar um, in a very hot climate, and that is that often um, the, um, the enslaved die young. So in importing um, the various slaves in, at um, fairly early what happens is that the slave population outnumbers the white population. Um, and um, there are threats and rumors of rebellion. 
Um, and this is an image of that, of rebellion. Um, there was um, a rumor in 1736, let's have the next one. That's okay. Um, what I wanted, to, let me talk about the, the uh, rebellion just for a minute. Um, and that is, because I will come back to it. But here, what I wanted to show is I wanted to show the, um, the discrepancy of numbers um, that the slaves definitely do outnumber um, the owners who are, um, and the owners are frightened um, for their situation. Um, next. It is that fear of um, revolt that leads the uh, royals to come back to uh, Boston to know that they um, have to leave. Um, and um, when they come back, the land that they purchase um, belonged earlier to John Winthrop, who was the governor of Massachusetts, the Puritan governor of Massachusetts. He had 600, 600 acres, um, but um, when the royals come back in the 1730s, um, they purchase 500 of those acres, and they also um, rebuild the house. Let's see what's next. <laughs> okay, here, here I am going back to what happened to the um, the leaders of the revolt in the 1730s in um, Antigua. And so here I'm hoping to illustrate uh, what many people thought was the ideal relationship um, of uh, you know, um, workers um, in the fields, um, happy and producing um, a windmill, um, but with, uh, and you probably can't see it in the back, but there is um, like a castle structure up on the hill um, that is like a garrison. So there's, there are these conflicted images that go into the story of slavery and enslavement. There's the story that is projected as ideal, and then there's also a backstory. Okay, here we are in Medford, um, and this is the uh, royal house uh, that was um, updated, rebuilt, enlarged uh, with uh, the funds um, of Isaac Royal. Uh, that house still stands in Medford. Um, it is, the acreage though has gone from 500 acres down to one acre. And this is part of the uh, campus of Tufts University. Um, the, uh, there's also the slave um, quarters are still there. They're built in brick. Um, often in Massachusetts and the Commonwealth, uh, we don't like to talk about uh, the fact that there was slavery here um, on the ground that we're walking, uh, but there was. So the royals, uh, when they came back in the 1730s uh, with lots and lots and lots of money, uh, wanting to make um, a big impression on the community, um, they, they spread out, they married, um, and uh, they often they moved um, in other locations and a number of them moved to Cambridge. This house, uh, which was lived in by Isaac uh, Royal Jr.'s um, uh, stepsister, um, is now the home, um, the hereditary uh, residence for um, the president of Harvard University. And it still has that um, role today. Um, next. Uh, this is another one of the houses that the royal family, uh, yeah, technically the royal family had in the 1700s. Um, 
they, um, in some of the reading that I did, it was fascinating the kind of lifestyle that they had. Um, they had lots and lots of money, um, and they had a, a social life where they moved back and forth between one rich house and another. Uh, these houses during the um, American Revolution, however, were um, confiscated and um, taken over and used uh, by um, the, um, the army, the American army. Um, this image um, is of Isaac Royal on the right when he's a very young man. He has just come back from Antigua. Um, he's here with his wife, his sister-in-law, and his sister. His sister is the one all the way on the left. And the little, uh, the little girl that we see here is uh, one of the little girls that we saw grown up in the first painting. This is Isaac Royal when he's much older, when he, in the 1770s. Um, he's changed a bit. Um, I, ha I mentioned in the writing that his hand is pointed toward a document. Um, he had lots and lots of documents. He owned a great deal of property. He was able to um, acquire uh, wealth um, through um, um, by his relationships, his entrepreneurial relationships with others. Next. He, he came to uh, the area certainly long before the American Revolution uh, broke out. But he stayed and uh, the change happened. The, um, he was torn, though. Having been in uh, Boston and Medford, he was more on the side of the Americans, but his investments and his business dealings were, uh, connected him to England. Um, so he really did not want to leave, but he was forced to uh, because of the situation that he faced. I put in uh, Crispus Attucks here. You've certainly heard of Crispus Attucks, who was um, in 1770, he was the first person to fall in what is called the Boston Massacre. Um, Crispus Attucks, perhaps you know, perhaps you don't, was of Native American and African American blood. Um, there was a lot of intermixture between Native Americans and African Americans early on. Uh, they faced similar circumstances, um, and uh, Crispus actually had run away from, uh, from slavery. Um, he had been a slave, I believe, in Framingham, and he had um, come to Boston. He worked on ships. That was often the occupation that a number of runaways took, because in going on the ships, they were not in a fixed location. It was not as easy to find them. Um, one of the things that stuns me about Crispus Attucks and the relationship to history is that when the print was done of the Boston Massacre, Crispus Attucks, his complexion was whitened. Here we have the seal of the royal family. Um, the seal that comes from uh, their heritage and their experience in Antigua, uh, making money from uh, sugar, from, from growing, uh, from agriculture. And that shield um, was taken up um, later uh, by the Harvard University. When um, Royal left the United, well, it wasn't, it was almost the United States. It was becoming the United States. Uh, when he left Boston um, in 1773 and went first to Canada and then to England, um, he wrote a will. He wrote a will in England, and in that will, he left some property to Harvard. Um, and that property was eventually sold. Um, it was, so, but 
Earlier I had mentioned that the economics of the American Revolution, um, that they were um, poor, that the uh, economy fell during that time, so the value of the property that Royal left also fell. It wasn't immediately that uh, Harvard was able to sell that property. So they sold it later, um, and when they did sell it, um, Harvard decided, because Royal had given them the option whether to invest the proceeds in um, the law school or in the medical school. And they, um, Harvard decided that they wanted to create um, a law professorship. So that's how they used the money. <coughs> and Harvard took the seal um, to, in homage to where the money had come from, Harvard took the seal of the royal family as the seal of the law school. One of the slaves who was brought from Antigua to New England and Medford was a slave named Belinda. And in 1783, <clears throat> after um, Isaac Royal had gone to England, Belinda, who was an older woman at that time, I'm going to get some water, um, wanted to be um, her old age was upon her, and she wanted to have um, some security for her old age. She wanted to be taken care of, and she believed that her labor, unpaid with um, the royals, entitled her to sustenance, so she sued. She also had a daughter who was um, crippled in some way, and she wanted to be able to provide for herself and her daughter. So she goes to court, <coughs> and a petition is <coughs> entered on her behalf. And from a legal perspective, uh, that is the first um, legal case for reparations, for saying, um, I provided my labor, I want recompense, I want um, I want to I want I want to retire. I want some of my retirement benefits. Um, and um, what happened was that the court did decide that she was entitled to those benefits. Um, the benefits were paid for a year, <clears throat> and then they were the payments were stopped. The judgment was for life. Uh, that didn't happen. She went back to court, um, and she was paid for either a year or two after that. Uh, and then they stopped, and she did not go back to court. Most likely she had already passed. But it's quite courageous of her <coughs> and to have gone to court and said, I am due something for the labor that I invested. Um, it's a quid pro quo. I did this for you. I gave you my life. I gave you my, the energy, and I want to be taken care of. Um, I'm going back to the beginning. I wanted to show the, an example of the ship that um, William Ryle had come on in um, 1629. It's called Alliance Whelp. Um, and um, it's a small ship, uh, but it got a lot of people here. Next. Um, I'm mentioning the desire. I had talked about the desire earlier, and that was the ship that was built, the first ship built in America to expressly carry slaves. Um, and it left from Salem in 1637, carrying war captives from the Pequot War to the Caribbean. They were mostly men and boys. I've, I've read that there was one woman on board, um, but the, um, the Puritans preferred to enslave women and keep them captive. Um, most likely, there might have been several reasons, um, and one reason might be um, the women, uh, when they had children, it was less likely that they were going to leave their children and run back to the reservation. Um, another one might be um, the tendency of uh, men in power to take its sexual advantage of women who don't have the same degree of power. Um, 
And as I said before, when it came back from the Caribbean, the desire I uh, had on board, I always think that the desire is a, a very curious name for a ship and expresses some of that energy of what was it that the um, Puritans desired. They desired money, they desired control, they desired wealth. Um, they desired to enter history, and they certainly did. Um, and it is Winthrop, and when they, the uh, ship, the Desire, comes into Boston in um, the next year, in 1638, uh, Winthrop um, sees the arrival, and he writes in his diary in February 1638 about the arrival of the Africans in the hold of the ship. Next. I couldn't find um, an image of the desire, um, but I did find an image of uh, a slave ship. And one of the things, uh, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting, but the occupants of the ship are um, chained together in very small spaces. And when I saw that, what, I, what immediately came to mind was whether or not it was a floating prison. We talk so much today about the high level of incarceration. It's as though a number of us came here incarcerated. Next. Okay, I talked a bit about Harvard. Uh, so um, that um, he supported the American Revolution, but you know his business dealings were such that his um, loyalties were on the side of the loyalists, um, and so he has to leave. He has to leave his property. He loved that uh, mansion uh, by the Mystic River, um, but he never got back there. It was his home. It was his desire to come back, um, but he did not return. Um, and he writes his will in 1778. Um, and it's my sense that, and we can talk about this later, it's my sense that he, um, he saw Harvard, he never had sons, he only had daughters. Um, and that um, daughters are wonderful, but daughters don't carry the name forward. And he wanted to carry the name forward, I believe. Um, and um, it's my speculation, but we have someone with us who, uh, Debbie Allen, who might be able to answer some more of these questions. Um, so he does leave the money to Harvard. One of the fascinating things, and it's not in um, this PowerPoint, but in doing some of this research, what I, I read was that um, at a certain point, Harvard was having a lot of trouble uh, financially. Maybe a, a tiny uh, footnote is that Harvard begins, Harvard starts 1636, 1637, 38. So Harvard has its beginnings at the same time that slavery does, as the same time that um, the, the ships are going back and forth. Uh, but early in its career, um, it falls on difficult financial uh, times. And uh, one of the ways that it pulls itself up or stamps down on others to elevate itself is that it, um, it opens a school for Indians, an Indian college. Um, and there is philanthropy for that. So it is uh, given money uh, and it does indeed open its doors at an early point uh, to Indian scholars, um, Native American scholars. Um, but then after that, its fortunes take off and climb, and it doesn't need that help to the same extent. Uh, but Harvard, by this point, has built a very strong reputation for itself. Um, and Isaac Royal, um, who's very much about uh, reputation, one of the fascinating things, if you go to visit some of these houses, is that you walk into them and there's so much money invested in the first rooms, their, their agenda was impressing a public. 
That was what was really important. It was the show. Um, and I feel there was a bit of show in um, Isaac Royal choosing to leave money to Harvard. Um, but anyway, he does leave it, and it's the beginning of Harvard Law School, um, and the seal is kept until 2016, when some African American students realize this history and rail against it, and the seal is um, taken down. Next. Let's go to the next one. Okay, yeah, this is where I'm going to end. Um, very, and I take a little license here, Veritas, which is truth in Latin. It's the motto of Harvard Law School. And I wonder where is the truth? Where is the truth hiding? Um, in the question of what was the price of freedom? How much did it cost? Who had to pay? Who benefited? Who got, it, who got the most profit? Who got the most return? What do we do with all of that now? Because that is the question. That is the question that's facing us today. Thank you. <laughs>